John Versations podcast. This is episode 24. And my guest today is an extremely talented multi instrumentalist and songwriter. He's the basis and backing vocalist for the band State Champs. And he is also the guitarist, vocalist, and the creative mind behind Speak Low If You Speak Love. John Versations listeners, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Ryan Graham. Ryan, thank you so much for being here, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, John. I'm excited, man. Dude, it's, uh, we were talking a little bit before, man, but it is so good. I've, I've known you, I mean, we've known each other since we were little kids. Um, you know, I mean like yes. early teenage, I'm a couple years older than you, but, but not much. Yep. And, um, you are somebody that I've had the privilege of watching you f- not only find a passion, but then watching you pursue that passion as you got older and then seeing great things happen for you has just been like, I, t- I talk to my wife anytime you, you put something out. I show my wife, I'm like, check this out. Like he just did this Jimmy Eat World cover. They, oh, they just did this video with Simple Plan. We were, I was showing her that today. I was like, did yeah. you see the Matchbox 20? And then the, the Speak Low stuff is just completely on a on a uh, whole different level. So, you know, I wanted to start off by just saying like, I am so beyond proud of you as a person from, you know, knowing you as a kid and, and what you've accomplished as a man. And, and I'm just very, very grateful that you took some time to come in and, and hang out today, man. I really appreciate you saying that, man. I think you kind of probably have like a very unique uh, view of me because like you said, I mean, dude, when we met, <clears throat> I didn't know what I wanted to do. I I think, you know, I was just like a confused teenager who kind of found, like accidentally found music. And um, you were a big catalyst in me wanting to do it in the first place. So I have a lot of uh, gratitude and debt that I owe to you as well, because, you know, I was explaining to my girlfriend this morning, like, <clears throat> I mean, dude, I, I, your band was one of the first like punk rock bands I ever liked or ever even really knew. Um, you know, I knew it was on the radio, but I was, you know, I was more of like a hip hop kid until I went to see you guys play at the summit in Canton. I think that was like the first time I ever saw Mercury Shoes play. And that, that like, I remember that show when you guys and Sandbox Heroes and there's a number of other bands that just like totally flipped the switch for me because I'd never been a part of any kind of community like that. Never been a part of anything like that. Never even seen it. I didn't know existed. And so uh, that was very fundamental for me um, growing up. I think I was probably 14 or 15, you know, like uh, about to go in high school. Yeah. So, dude, I have I have uh, a lot of respect and uh, and uh, gratitude for you. So, thanks well, for showing me something really cool, man. Well, I, I want you to know, like that is something. First of all, thank you because, like I said, man, like I, I'm a huge fan of yours creatively and 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 knowing that you have a career that I'm able to follow, like seeing you mm. hit milestones and stuff like that. Like, like I, like I said, it's just one of those things where it's like it just makes you, you, you were the kid who knew every word to the songs I was writing when I was in high school. You dude, I was kid, a punisher. I was dude, a punisher. Dude, you would get up on stage and grab the mic. And so I want you to know that, that was reciprocated. Like, like yeah. the, the fact that like you were in the front row and you knew those words, it made me at that time feel like, Oh shit. Like I'm doing something that is, is me like that gave me, especially as I got older, man, because there was plenty of times where, you know, I was like, man, I, maybe I should just get a factory job or do something like that. But yeah. like, it was those kind of things that kind of keep me for kept me pushing and playing for as long as I did. And like, I don't know, I, when you said you're a hip hop, hip hop kid, I remember that, man. I remember the first time I met you, you had, uh, you're rocking like FUBU shorts. <laughs> and, and, Always baggy pants and jerseys and, and sweatpants. Yeah. yeah. And, well, I remember, and I don't know if you remember this, but I remember when you got your first guitar because yep. we were at Club Triune, and yep. uh, which was, you know, for those people listening in Michigan, there's a, a a church that was sometimes a venue. It was called Club Triune, and you showed up, and you're like, dude, I got this guitar. You're like, let me show you what I've been working on. And I was like, fuck yeah, dude. Because, yeah. you know, you're like, it was cool to see you, like, come into these shows and, like, kind of, 
falling into that scene and then being like, well, fuck it. I like it. I'm going to do it for myself. You yeah. Know? I wanted, I wanted to be a part of it because I thought it was so cool. Like I thought everybody that I met was already a rock star, like already like established, you know, playing for 50 people was like the craziest thing for me, you know? And so then when I started playing acoustic shows at like, uh, the internet cafe and stuff like that, you know, if I could get 20 people out there, I was, I was, you know, beyond words. I was so happy. You're like, but that's get so off funny. That autograph book, baby. <laughs> that's so funny that I, I probably like brought my guitar. Like I was that kid who was, who was like adding all you guys on AOL instant messenger because I was trying to pick your brain. Like I w- was that invested so quickly that I just was like, okay, these guys are doing this that I have, I don't have any experience with that. I don't know anything about, I need to know everything about it. And I felt like you you and like Evan Baker and like the guys from the great basement crusade and Eric Niccolo from which way is home. Like all of those guys, you guys were accessible and you guys were cool. Even though I know looking back how annoying I was like straight up, I was like a dork about it. Yeah. Uh, But, but I think, and I think it's easy to see yourself in that perspective because I feel the same way. Like, I don't know if you remember Edison Clio, of course. I watched your episode. Yeah. So Stephanie came on and, and that's how I, w- I was like, I just, I want to talk to these guys. Like they're yeah. playing like big shows. And I remember that, like you said, AOL instant messenger days, like Rich who ran drive through on their website, he used to put up his AOL instant messenger. So yeah, I remember recording, you know, in the place to be in a basement. And then I sent it to him and I got on AOL instant messenger. I was like, Hey, did you get that? Like, what did you think? Like, what you, what do we need to do? Does it sound good? <laughs> so it's like, it's funny that you have that perspective because I think back to myself, you know, I was a little fat ass kid, man. I, that's the reason <laughs> I played guitar is like, I didn't know how to talk to people or I felt right. like fat and goofy. So I was like, Oh, maybe this will like, let me express myself in a way that people might want to listen to. Mm-hmm. So, and I know like, I felt like I was bugging the shit out of anybody who was older than me. I was just like, right. I just, I want to soak everything up. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and I mean, even I'll, I'll tell you what, man, I was going back and listening to uh, the dry leaf project. Uh, I was like, like, prepping of course for the interview. you were. I was like, dude, I haven't lit. Well, you know, it's so long ago and yeah. you start thinking about stuff and, <laughs> and I went back and man, like the stuff that's on Spotify is like, is good. <laughs> it's good. You know what I mean? It's, it's well, like, luckily we put like our, I think our like last record that we put out before we broke up, we put out, on, uh, we put it up on Spotify and like, that is, it, I'm, I, there are some decent songs on that. Like I'm not, I'm not ashamed when I go back and listen to that, but when I go back and listen to like the first dry leaf project stuff that I did, oh, it's pretty rough. Yeah. Somebody sent me uh, a copy of the place to be digitally and I listened to it and I was like, I would never, <laughs> never let, anybody listen to this ever like i mean well it was, i need it, you to send it to me because i think i lost it. oh you can i'll send it to you yeah postmark is on there and and all those songs so right. yeah i'll i'll uh i'll email it to you after the show but um yeah man it, but i remember playing with you guys um after mercury issues i was in robots and we played with you yep. uh in the dry leaf project at uh salem high school and i remember watching you guys play and i was like like oh like shit it's so good that he picked up like like all the dudes in the band were nice guys you know what i mean but like i always had that like extra soft spot i think for you and so seeing you play i was like i'm so fucking happy that he did this that like like you got the like you started playing and like just kind of what because i because i I can't help it man i was thinking about you just being like okay how do you make this chord on that little acoustic and then now, like you're putting on fucking shows, and you sound good. Like your song, your, like your songwriting is good. The like the 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 composition, like the parts that you're playing, it's like you you could listen and be like, okay, he's not just fucking around on guitar. Like he's he's diving in and and trying to figure it out. Well, I was, but I was stumbling through and and figuring it out at the same time, which I still think I do. Like when I look at some of the bands that we play with, like now on this, you know, a professional level, I'm like, dude, I'm a, I'm a scrub. Like I'm (laughs) a scrub musician, like compared to some of these guys, but you know, it's not always about that. It's about, you know, the passion that you have for it. And like you said, you know, the songs, like if the songs are there, they'll speak for themselves. It doesn't matter how like 
proficient you are, I guess. And so I'm kind of like happy with uh, the lack of um, knowledge I had growing up where it just kind of forced me to like figure it out and kind of, you know, I didn't really take guitar lessons or anything. I just, I just fumbled until I found cool, cool chords. And that was what I was always about was like tuning my guitar to some weird tuning and, yep. and playing, you know, uh, and I know my band hated it growing up cause none of them understood <laughs> that and it didn't make sense, but I didn't like, even what know what is I was open doing. E? I've exactly. Been playing, I've been playing that, you know, being, having the wife and the kid and stuff like i still i record songs here and and i still play but it's just me so i'm like oh well let me put this in open c or this sounds cool in open a or and you know so it's yeah, like yeah. then you you change the tuning and you're like oh what did i write the what fucking tuning was that and so like now i'm in the yes. habit of like this idea is an open a <laughs> <laughs> like, oh all my voice out. memos are like open e capo six idea <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, man. It's, uh, it's, it's, I don't know. Like I, I, and I, again, I think that's some place where we're similar is like, you know, growing up, you, my family provided, but it wasn't like there was a bunch of extra money. So like, of course, you know, the fact that I ever got, I have a friend, Jeff Klein, who, um, he, his, he had a, uh, remember he had a, a Squire, uh, uh, what was it? A, a Squire Strat and a little practice amp. And we would listen to like old Blink and stuff like that. And he'd be like, check it out. It's just like fucking four chords. Like if you know this, you yeah. can play this stuff. And so I like fell in love with it. And I told my mom, I was like, I, I just want a guitar. But there was no way I was getting fucking lessons. Like right. that shit was so expensive. So mm-hmm. she, I got a couple of books and she was like, if you want to learn the books, learn the books. And I was like, just put on the radio and I'll try to figure it out. You know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? But yeah, it's, it's, I don't know. It's uh like I said, it's just kind of crazy, man. Cause you know, I, part of me, part of me when, when I feel similar to like Joey Fava, you know, we played in, mm. in bands with him too, but like, I've like with him, I still have that, like that almost like little brother kind of feeling like you, you feel like a proud older brother when you mm-hmm. see them doing good things. And that's the same feeling I have for you. It's just like, you know, I saw that video that you did with uh simple plan and we are the Kings. And I was like, I was in my living room, like, fuck it. That's awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, Dude, you know, I mean, I didn't expect any of that stuff to happen either. You know, for me, it was always a dream. And then, like, you know, when it started happening, I was just like, I'm still, I'm still like, what is happening? What, is, like, how is this happening? What's going on? You know, meeting the guys from Civil Plan on Warp Tour, and then, you know, them taking us on their headliner, and then we write a song with them, and then we're playing with them every night. Like, dude, I, I don't know. Feels like a alternate reality. Seriously. Well, and especially like when you grew up and, and I will say, you know, I, and I, I want to kind of backtrack here in a minute, but one sure. thing I will say about state champs is I love listening to your band because of the fact that it is so there, like you can listen to the first record and I know the first couple records you weren't on, right. You didn't join until like, what Just was the, it? Like the two, first, okay. first record. So you joined like 2013, 2014, 14. right? Yep. Okay. So that first record, I mean, it's it's a good record. The, the heart is there. And as the records go on, like the production quality gets better, but it's mm-hmm. still very true and very much rooted in the stuff that I loved. Yeah. You know, like the newfound glory is there. Like the, of course. Like the enema of the state sounds, the, you know, the take off your pants and like all that, the starting line kind of vibes. Like I'd like, so when I listen to that, it's almost like, it's like a time machine to the present is like the only way that I can think about explaining it. I think that's what kind of makes me just gravitate or, or like feel so affectionate about it. It's just, that's cool. That's cool. I think I, we do kind of get that uh, often, you know, that's, it's like a, it's like a modern nostalgic sound, um, which I think is a really, really cool compliment because, you know, it can reach so many people, like you said, you know, you're, a few years older than me. So like, I feel like when we have, uh, you know, people who are older than us at our shows, they usually find something that they are like, Oh, this is reminiscent of this band that I really like. And it's, and it's not this automatic, like turn up my nose at this, this modern pop punk band, because I think a lot of them do that. A lot of older people kind of don't really give that kind of credit to the, to, to the genre, which 
I kind of understand because a lot of modern pop punk is very bad. Um, but it's cool to be that band that kind of gives you that nostalgic feeling of, you know, something like the starting line or the drive through area. Um, because like I grew up loving that stuff too. And uh, now that we're like able to play shows with those bands, it's, uh, it's very humbling, but it's also like weird and well, cra like crazy straight up. Yeah, and I, well, I think that's a good point too because I mean, what I and again, I think this is something that really sticks out about you guys. But one thing that I've noticed is that a lot of the times now, when you hear pop punk, in, in, in and again, like you know, this is just the opinion of some dude who listens to music at home. But a a lot of a lot of what I'm hearing is more pop, right? It's like you've got sure. like pop punk with like auto tune and like 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 trying to be. Like we're, we want to be pop punk, but we also want to be like top 40. And I think when right. you, when you are trying, when you're leaning into that, you're kind of taking away from the heart of, of what it's all about. And one thing that I like about you guys is that you're not le You're like, no, like we're a, a pop punk band. That's still there. Like you guys, you play fast. There's, I mean, the, you got some killer licks. I have to say, man, I love your fucking dancing. Like that's one of my <laughs> favorite things is, is seeing you get down. But I think that's where, you know, when you think about the bands of that genre who have, who have had hits, who have charted and stuff like that, that's what they're doing is that they're sure. leaning into that. No, like this is what we are. We're not trying to be something else. Right. I think you guys do a, 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 a extremely good job at being genuine to like what your influences are and what kind of sound you want. And it doesn't sound like you're trying to be like, Oh, well maybe if we sound like this, we'll get played here. Or maybe it's like, no, we're just sure. fucking cool. Do what we want to do. That's a cool compliment. I appreciate that. It's hard because you know, like you want to be, uh, you know, you want to be pop enough for those people to in enjoy it, but also you want to be punk enough to like get the cred from, you know, the people that you want to be like, it, it's a, it's a strange balance that we've kind of always, we've struggled with it. So it's funny that you say that it's like, it seems effortless because I think it does take work to kind of straddle that line of, of uh, not necessarily staying true. Cause I think that part is easy, but like you feel tempted maybe, I guess, by, you know, this next level, like if could, we go to this next level if we do this certain thing or if we write a song like this um uh, so you know we're kind of always trying to unlock that like perfect balance of of the pop and the punk and uh and we'll, i don't know we'll see if we can get there on this next record yeah man i'm well i'm i'm excited for it i'm i'm definitely looking forward to it and and uh um, yeah, I do want to talk a little bit more about that because I know that you guys have got, uh, your, uh, unplugged stuff that's just come out. So mm -hmm. I want to get to that too, but kind of before we jump to that, I do want to take a couple steps back because, sure. um, you know, you were, you're in the dry leaf project and I know that started off, you know, just like you said, friends that you had in, in school and, you know, you, it's, it's, it's funny because even though like some people are older, like. Jordan ended up coming playing, like, left the great basement crusade and, and came to play for us. Right. And mm -hmm. like, you know, people kind of mix match around, but uh, eventually you ended up linking up with uh, good luck varsity. So talk to me a little yep. bit about like, I, I want to kind of get into your progression and how you met the the state champs guys and, and how that all kind of fell into place for you. But sure. let's talk a little bit about, you know, it seemed like good luck varsity was your, your, and I know you guys built a huge following, like you were touring all the time. So mm -hmm. how did that happen? How did stepping into that take place? So I guess when the dry leaf project kind of started fizzling out, um, I don't know. We just kind of had those, you know, you, you know what you, when, when you're in a band with your friends, but it's like, man, you, you I, I love this person but i can tell that they're not as committed to this as like you want them to be but you can't force them to do like you can't make somebody care as much as you do and i feel like i kind of just had that realization where i'm like man i'm constantly writing songs and i want to do the next thing i want to get to the next level i don't want to go to college i don't want to do this like i just want to do music and i'm like so committed to it but uh you know friends are starting families they're starting families earlier than you think that maybe like you're ready to so you let them do that and so that's kind of what happened with the dry leaf project i was just i you know i wasn't fed up but i was just i needed out i needed to do something else so um actually funny because 
when the dry leaf project broke up, I started doing speak low stuff like very casually. I started writing songs again with just my acoustic and that's, that's, I just feel like I always go back to that. The dry leaf project started just me in my room with an acoustic. We broke up after we became a full band and then I go back and I start speak low. I start writing songs and the link up with good luck varsity was, was pretty seamless because dry leaf and good luck varsity were like best friend bands Mm -hmm. We played like played every show together. We were just, we were friends outside of the band. It just kind of, you know, it was natural for me to like kind of already be in that camp. So I think I got the opportunity to go on a, a full U S tour with them as a merch guy. And so I started as the merch guy, um, obviously not selling any merch. I just really went along in the van and, <laughs> and like goofed off and, you know, did a lot of stupid stuff with them. Um, but then I think when Jen, uh, left on guitar, it was just like, you know, it, there was no second thought from me or the band. It was just like, yeah, Ryan's going to be in the band. So we started touring pretty heavily and started writing together. And that was cool because, um, you know, they, I guess like kind of already were a little bit more established than any band that I had been in. You know, we did a lot of touring, not a ton of successful touring, but a lot of touring where I cut my teeth and, you know, got to see the world and well, got to see the, the United States. And Yeah, but at that age, that, man, like that's like, because I've it been was there. Key. You're in a van and you're like, fuck, I'm, I'm doing some real traveling. You know, like, Dude, it was, it was like for me, like that was the greatest part about being in that band. Like, even if we showed up to a venue and there was two people there, we we would play the show. But it was just like, yo, getting here was fun. Yeah, and we're gonna have home. fun after exactly, and we're gonna go play, have fun tomorrow. Did you play Kirksville, Missouri? It doesn't sound familiar. I Kirksville, so. we we when I was when we were in the Rising Tide with uh, with Evan, who was in Good Luck Varsity. We Kirksville, we just had like some crazy following there, so it was always like Kirksville tonight, boys. <laughs> like we had those pockets, we had like like two or three of those pockets around the United States where like 150 kids would show up, and then we would go play anywhere else. And it was like, if there's 15 people here, we're stoked. But I don't know, you know how it goes. Like booking booking tours on MySpace was not not always the most like fruitful thing ever. Well, yeah, I mean, I think people don't understand because when you hear like a band's like touring, especially if you're not somebody who's in that world, because I know, I mean, this is how, how I thought it was, you know, for a really long time too. It's like, oh, like somebody booked all these shows for them right. and they just get in the van and they're like, you got to be here this night, here that night. And it's like, nah, like you're, <laughs> you're like, you're on, you know, back then MySpace or, yeah. you know, you're calling people on, on and be like, hey, can we please come? Like, do you have any night? And then you're trying to, get it to where you're actually in a line where you could be like, well, yeah. Filling holes to, every day. I don't have to drive to Missouri and then drive to Indiana. And then right. like, you know, dude, that yeah. was, that was tough, man. That was like, that was definitely my least favorite thing about being in a band was trying to book your own tours and make them make sense because you knew you weren't going to be making more than 50 bucks. Even if you made, if, if you even got lucky enough to make 50 bucks, you know, and then you're like, okay, well, we got to think about gas bunny. We got to think about where the hell are we going to sleep? Um, you know, and then like, is it going to be, is it, is there a point to drive seven hours out of the way to play the show that no, probably nobody's going to be at, you know? Mm-hmm. So like we were, we would beg, borrow and steal to get on a show, you know, like we would look up everybody's touring schedule and we would email them or hit them up on MySpace and be like, we're this band from this area. Like we just had a show fall through. Can we just play for 15 minutes at the front of your show? Like I remember emailing 21 pilots and I had no idea who that band was. Mm -hmm. They were, they were nothing, but they were playing a show for, you know, at a venue that I had heard of. And, uh, they emailed us back and they were like, Oh, we really wish we could help you out, but there's just like no time slot. Like, I just remember looking back on some old messages from like, bands that went on to be huge that I like totally tried to punish to get on the show, like house of heroes and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, it was such a headache, but I mean, I will never, ever, ever forget those, those tours and those moments because of how much work and how much just like how connected you were to what you were doing at that time. You're so plugged in. 
Yeah, man. It, it like, that's, that's one thing too, you know, like I've got a kid now and I've got a normal job and you know, I like, like I wouldn't trade my life now for anything, but it's, it's for me, it's going to be really cool when my daughter gets a little bit older and she does something stupid and I can be like, well, listen, like, you know, we almost got arrested for stealing, you know, a basket of bread from a hotel. Cause we didn't know how <laughs> we were going to eat. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, it, like I've been there. Yeah. Like it's, it's going to be cool to, to, to have those stories and, and be able to, I don't know. It's, it's a crazy life, man. If, if, if you, I think it's hard for people who haven't lived it. Like you got to really, I've always described it as like, if you're in a band, you've got, you know, four girlfriends plus a girlfriend, you know what I mean? <laughs> because everybody wants your time. Everybody, yeah. you like, you have a responsibility to, to everyone. So, you know, if, if, and then you, and then you're like, Hey, I got a great idea. Let's all just pack into like a six person band for, a month yep. and hope we don't kill each other. <laughs> you know I mean? And so. you just almost always did. I, that, that was the thing. Like, that's so funny that you say that because I would find myself like just prioritizing the band over everything in my life. You know, like if I had a baseball game, I'd be like, nah, I got to go to practice. Or if I, you know, even if I had a job, I'd be like, I can't work this day. Like I would, I was totally willing to get fired from my, you know, crappy job just to like go to a band practice or, or play a show that probably didn't really matter, but it mattered to me. Oh yeah. And so that's, that's when I knew I was just like, man, like I gotta find a way to do this like forever. Um, that's when I knew I was like very committed to it because I was just dirt poor forever. I would work at PAX on, you know, eight hours a week to make 80 bucks to take on tour and just spend it all and come back and hope to have a job. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I was working at Carabas and, uh, we had a show and it was my first day and I was like, I have to be out by this time. I have to be here. Like I'm in a band. We have yeah. a show. And so it was getting close to that time. And I was like, am I good to go? And they were like, we're, man, we're really slammed tonight. Like we need you to stay. And I was like, fuck you. I quit. <laughs> Just, I worked there for maybe four and a half hours. <laughs> I was like, I'm done. <laughs> I quit. I'm not doing so it. So sick. Oh yeah. And, uh, Subway in downtown Plymouth, they were always nice enough to hire me back. I would like, I would work and then be like, yo, I'm out for a couple of weeks and then come back. And they'd be like, eh, I guess you can work yeah. need somebody to make a sandwich. So I did have a handful of those jobs that I got lucky enough to like to be cool enough with the managers who would put you back on the schedule and like totally understand what you were doing. And that was pretty instrumental to like being able to do that and live when you came back. You know, like I worked at, I did that, like I worked at PacSun. They were cool to let me go. And then um, when I moved on, I, I delivered pizzas and you know, the pizza place that I worked at, they were always like very cool with me going on tour I'm sure it was like probably the most annoying thing to be like, okay, when are you going to be gone? And can I schedule you this date? But to be, to be able to, to have understanding people in your life like that uh, was, was pretty special because I don't know if I would have been able to do that without that kind of understanding. I didn't really have that for my parents. They didn't get it at all. Yeah. You know, they would, they would come every once in a while to a show and support me, but I mean, they didn't really, they didn't really understand it. I don't think they really understood it until they really, they saw us come play at a, I don't know, when I played with, with uh, all time low, I think mm -hmm. we did a, we did a tour in, in Michigan, uh, in 2015 and we opened for all time low. And it, I, I mean, that was when I saw my parents be like, Oh, like this is different than what you were doing earlier. Yeah. I'm in an arena. Like <laughs> this isn't, this <laughs> yeah. isn't the internet cafe. Right. Strange things, man. Man, that's all. Yeah, my mom used to come to shows all the time. My mom, my mom just recently started drinking. Um, she's you know in her fifties, but she couldn't sleep because of like all the stress from COVID and all this stuff. Like yeah. she was just like having a hard time. The the doctor was like, if you can't sleep, drink wine. So now she has like a little wine before she goes to bed. She feels very like. Ooh, I'm doing something bad. But uh, <laughs> she used to come to shows all the time. I remember like playing like the Plymouth Rock and being like, "Hey, everybody, that's my mom. Uh, be nice, buy her a drink." And like, 
Like all these people would come yep. up with drinks and she'd be like, I don't drink. I can't take any of these. <laughs> but it was so like, you little, probably took them. Oh no. It was just like a little prank to play on her. Cause you know, she would always come and just kind of sit and watch to be supportive. So I like yeah. to get as many people talking to her as possible. So that was my way to like, just get her surrounded by people who are trying to be nice to her and then watch her kind of clam up. So, and she listens right. to every show. So I love you, mom. But, <laughs> but Hi, so, mom. so one of my favorite things I think I saw you do in good luck varsity is you guys have that video where, uh, it was all like you each had a little kid that played you. Um, mm. and I thought that was hilarious, especially because that was around the time from what I understand you, you broke your, was it your foot or your leg? My ankle. Okay. Um, yeah, not my finest moment for sure. <laughs> but that video was, was, was totally inspired by, you know what I, like we 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 wanted to find some kids to to like show off our personalities each of our personality in the band and you know dress them like us and we made them do stuff that we did throw water balloons and smash people's sandwiches and stuff like that just the stupid antics that we would get in on get into on tour you know uh going to movie theaters sneaking to movie theaters for free and see oh, yeah. and stuff like that but yeah uh there was a tour um where well, first of all, our our thing on tour, Good Luck Varsity's thing, was to bridge jump. We on days off, we would find some highway overpass or some bridge or whatever to jump into a body of water. Uh, for whatever reason, like that was just our thing. That we, none of us really played sports. We didn't really have like hobbies outside of you know just hanging out, I guess. And that was our thing. And there was a show that we were on our way to in, in Iowa and I wanted to bridge jump and I stopped the van on a highway and thought that it was a good idea to just take my clothes off and jump without testing the depth. And I broke my heel and both my ankles. I, bro I broke my left heel and both my ankles. And, uh, so in the video I was I was like crippled at the point. Yeah, I was think I was in a wheelchair. Or I was I was on crutches, and we made the, my character uh, at the end be in a wheelchair <laughs> because he jumped off. He jumped off the bridge. Well, and I I thought that was good because he like they film him like doing the jump, which I thought was really <laughs> funny too. I was like, man, I really hope nobody just kicked that kid in the back. <laughs> <laughs> no. So when, it was great. How, how deep was it when you when you? Felt well, like, not deep enough, right? Uh, obviously, it, not as deep as you are tall, yeah. Uh, so it was probably you know, this is just an estimate, but I think it was you know, 30 40 foot highway overpass. When you think you know, you're on the freeway and and mm -hmm. you see a body of water, and it was it was a, a tributary of the Mississippi River, so you know, I i thought for sure, like, I was just confident for no real good reason other than you know being a kind of a rambunctious kid and i jumped in um it was probably two feet Jesus. like there was not a, there was <laughs> like, like almost wow. no water in there and i feel like i knew it as soon as i jumped i knew something was was wrong so i just mm -hmm. kind of braced myself and i think that's really what saved me you know like i did a pencil dive and just my feet took the weight. Mm -hmm. um, so I got really lucky. I probably should have been paralyzed or dead maybe. Um, Jesus. So I, I kind of always look on that experience as like a, as like a, a blessing or like not a blessing, but like a, a, you know, a reason that there's a reason why I'm still here. There's a reason why it wasn't worse than it was. And it was honestly shortly after that is when I met the state champs guys and kind of like made the transition um, so I always think about that, like if I would have not made it from that or if something, you know, really tragic would have happened, like I probably wouldn't be in the position that I am today. And I kind of always try to be thankful for that. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good, it's a good outlook to have too. I, I mean, I'm guessing you probably don't do a shit ton of bridge jumping <laughs> nowadays. I, I, so, you know, there was a couple of years where I obviously there was no way that I was going to do it, but we had a stop at a, at a, we had a day off in Australia and there was this really famous watering hole that we went to and I, I redeemed myself finally. So I, I did, I saw everybody else jumping off. I saw that it was safe 
and I did it. And uh, it was a rush. It was exactly the way I remember. <laughs> I remembered it. So I'm glad I did it. But yeah, I ha- I don't do it very often. It's not. I I take a lot less risks than I used to. Yeah. Well, I mean, it seems like too, like, you know, the older that you get, I mean, I know again with me having the kid and, and stuff like that, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that I used to do that I probably wouldn't do now. Cause there's, there's more shit to lose. You know what I mean? Like right. that's my whole thing is like, if anything ever happens that, I mean, especially with like Corona we've been being super careful. Cause it's like, man, if something happens to me or something happens to my wife, like the other one of us is a single parent, you know what I mean? So it's like, that's intense, man. Yeah. Dude, yeah. It's crazy. So well, I know you said, so shortly after that, t- talk to me a little bit about how you met like the state champs dudes and how like you kind of linked up there. Yeah, It was kind of, kind of like by chance, really. I mean, I, so I became friends with, with a girl named Emily that lived in Michigan um, by chance and she moved to New York and she started working at a venue and met um, Tyler, who's the guitar player from state champs and they became friends. And I think just one night for whatever reason, she was like, you know, you should talk to Tyler. You should talk to this guy. I mean, she knew how passionate I was about music. And I think good luck varsity was kind of slowing down and we were hitting some creative difference and some personality differences and whatnot. And, uh, she was like, I have this friend, but I think maybe she told him, she's like, I had this friend who's, you know, super dedicated and he's really good and and blah 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 and just totally gassed me up to him and so he and i started talking i think over twitter and we exchanged numbers and i went to go see them in uh, toledo one time and you know i saw them play and i was like okay this is cool like you know it's it's good but like i don't really know anything about it i don't I don't know, whatever. We kept talking and became better friends. And I think when they came back, they had just put out their first record. They put out the finer things and um, they were playing Grand Rapids with Bayside and Motion City Soundtrack. So it was a big tour and I went to go see them play and they stayed at my house afterwards. And after, um, after the show, everybody went to bed, but me and Tyler stayed up talking and chatting. And I just kind of, threw it out there, you know, very cheeky, like, uh, you know, if you ever need somebody to fill in or if you ever need help, please let me know. Um, I'm like, this is what I want to do. I want to be touring. And, you know, he knew that we, I had some touring experience, the good luck varsity. And, you know, we were putting out music videos and we were, you know, we were trying to take it as serious as like a local band could have at that point. And so he knew that I wasn't just, you know, bullshitting, I guess. Right. And, you know, I, I didn't expect anything from it. I just shot my shot, I guess. And a month later, he's like, we kicked out our bass player. Like, do you want to come up here and try out? And it was funny because I didn't play bass. Uh, so I had to borrow a bass. I didn't even own one. I didn't know what I was doing. I just listened to the record nonstop and I kind of learned it and drove 10 hours to Albany in a snowstorm to go try out for the band on my birthday weekend in 2014 <laughs> and dude it was just a, just a crazy kind of crazy coincidence that I, that that link ever happened um but you know the rest is history i guess from there you know i i did the did the tour with them and um they had pretty much the rest of the year lined up uh because at that point you know they put out the debut record and they had a booking agent at that point and they had a manager and they, they kind of had, you know, a track set for them. Uh, so I got to do that whole uh, record cycle with them. And then it was kind of like, okay, you know, you, after about a year, like you're in the band for sure. So it was cool. It was, it was just really random. I mean, I think I was in the right place, right time. That's awesome, man. I know it can be just from you know being somebody who has gone through that same Hey, like you play guitar, but we need somebody to play bass. Yeah. Uh, Cause even after, you know, the rise and tie, like I just played bass in the next band. Cause like nobody else fucking played bass. <laughs> yep. So yep. like it's, it's, uh, it can be, I know mentally that's like, Oh, well like shit. Like I have, I mean, I'll try to figure it out. You know what I mean? Um, let me ask you this. Like, you know, they have, they've got a touring cycle now at this point. Are they, are you guys just touring still the U S or are you going, you know, out of the country at that point or 
so my second tour ever with them was international, which was really, really cool for me because I, I think I went back like just recently and looked at like this old Tumblr that I used to have. And that, that was like my number one dream was like playing internationally, like playing a show in another country. Um, and I, I made some like sad boy post about how I was, you know, some crappy band was doing it and like they didn't deserve it. And I was like, I deserve this. Like, blah, blah, blah. It was like, it was like so petty and so stupid, but you know, that's how I genuinely felt at the time. And so it was funny, like my second tour ever with state champs, I got the opportunity to do that. And I told this story uh, not too long ago. Like I was just so excited uh, to be on like a, an international flight. I'd never been out of the country before that really ever. Um, and they were giving away drinks for free. And I just remember, you know, I'm like, Oh, I'm going hard. Like I'm celebrating right now. I'm about to, I'm about to touch down in London. And I got super drunk on the plane and ended up throwing up like three times in the bathroom on the plane. And I was just too like ashamed to tell the band for, because I didn't want to be that guy. I'm like, I'm still the new guy. Like I can't, I can't tell them that I am, you know, shot. Uh, so well, it sounds like you held your shit together, though. I mean, like, if if you could make it to the bathroom, you could throw up, nobody was like, oh, <laughs> damn, Ryan's, Ryan's messed up. Like, you know, I, dude, I am not a fan of flying. So uh, I've gotten better as I've gotten older because I've, you know, been flying more. But, like, for a long time, I did. So I, I had to drink before I flew. And there was, really? a couple of, there was a couple of times before I got in a fight where I was like, they're not going to let me on this fucking plane. <laughs> Cause I'm like standing in line, just swaying to the left. And like, I looked like messed up and luckily, but yeah, for my wife, very used to it. She, you know, flew all the time. So like, she kind of can calm me down through it now, but anytime there's turbulence, I'm like, we're all going to fucking die. Like, all of us, <laughs> like, like kiss the baby on the forehead. We're all going down. <laughs> so, oh my God. It's so bleak. Dude, it's terrible, but it's just, my mind jumps like worst case scenario. Um, so yeah, I mean, so like what what's that feeling like? Cuz I know like from what I understand at the same time you're still doing Speaklow, right? Like Yeah, I put out I put, I I released my first Speaklow record independently about a month before I joined the band. So, you know, I kind of put that out and put it on Bandcamp and was kind of like pitching it, I guess. Uh, you know, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was emailing it to people and finding people's emails and, and sending it out. And so Speaklow kind of went on the back burner um, for the first few years when I joined State Champs. And I don't think a lot of people know that I was doing that before I even joined the band. I think they just kind of thought like, oh, this is just something he does on the side. But I had a full record done before I even joined that band. Yeah. And then uh, Pure Noise re-released it uh, two years later. So that was cool that they kind of took me under their wing and, and trusted me enough to like release that um, officially, I guess. But dude, I mean, in regards to touring internationally, like it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty indescribable feeling, honestly, you know, people halfway around the world, sometimes who don't even speak your language, you know, like when we play in, in Japan, like it still blows my mind or even Europe, like blows my mind that those people who like don't regularly speak English somehow know every word and, and are screaming. Like it, it really is that kind of that, like, there's no barrier there at that point. You know, they're feeling what you're feeling, whether they really know what they're saying or not, but they believe it. And mm -hmm. that's the coolest thing is, is seeing somebody scream those words back at me. You know, it's, it's pretty humbling. Yeah. Well, I, I would think that, just kind of speaks to like i mean just talking about like you know what it what it's always what's always been attractive about it you know what i mean is that like like you kind of like what i was talking about with with like like seeing you you know what i mean being like this fucking kid knows the like the words to every one of these songs like every like mm. you know so to sit to like so you're like shit like i need to keep writing songs you know what i mean so when you are exactly you know, when you're in, you know, Japan and you're like, oh, fuck. You know what I mean? Like all these people know all the words of my songs. Like I don't know any of them yeah. and can't tell them thank you. You know what I mean? Because, <laughs> you know. Right. It makes you, yeah, it makes you like 
obviously it makes you more grateful for what you do, but it also just makes you want to never not do it. I mean, for me, that's like playing live is, I don't even, it's hard to like, that's when I come alive. I think, you know, when I'm, when I'm playing for somebody and I can see that it's having this psychological, like uh, emotional, uh, visceral, like reaction from, you know, that person's getting that from what I'm able to provide because I'm also a fan and listener and enjoyer of music. Like I have had those moments and I still have those moments. Like I know what it feels like. So the fact that I'm able to provide that for somebody is just the coolest thing in the world. It, it really is. And I, and I'm like, I still, I still get that feeling. And that's kind of why I think I'm still able to do what I'm doing is because I don't think I'm over it, you know, and I think it's pretty easy for somebody to get a taste of it and, you know, they do it and they drive it into the ground and then they're over it. But like, I don't know, it's, it's really special. Well, and I, you know, one thing that I, I, I was, I was kind of thinking about it the other day, but I was like, man, like before COVID and everything hit, like to have your schedule must be insane. Cause from what I understand, it was like state champs tour. And then as soon as you've got time off, it's, all right, now it's time for speak loaded tour. Like get yeah. these guys together. Let's learn these songs. I got to right. write this album and, and, and record. So, you know, like I said, I think for a lot of people, it, it might be easy to be like, you know, getting, getting burned out and, and stuff like that. But it seems like there are certain people out there where it, it seems like the work is like what kind of keeps them going. And that's the kind of, of person that I, I imagine you to be where it's like, no, I mean, I've like, this is what I do. So I have to keep right. doing it, you know? Um, no, yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. I, I, I mean, that's, you're pretty spot on. You know, I, I like the, the reason why I do it as hard as I do it is because I love it. You know, like it would be really nice to have a month off between a tour and kind of just kick it and recharge and, you know, spend time with my girlfriend and do these other things that I've been wanting to do, learn a new skill or go ride my bike or whatever. But at the same time, like I love speak low as much as I love state champs. And like, if I have two weeks to do a tour, I'm going to do it, you know, and that's the only time I have. So I have to, and you know, it's really hard to balance that and kind of find the time to like do everything that you want to do. But I think when you care enough, you make it happen. Yeah. Well, and I, I wonder too, I wanted to ask you, but do you think, do you think any of it is like a, a like if you slow down, you may miss an opportunity? Cause I've, I've caught myself wondering that before. It's like, you know, like I'm, you know, like I've been working super hard. I've toured, I've put out this record on my own. Now I'm in, mm. you know, now I'm in this band that's touring around the country and I still have this thing that I love, but I've got these opportunities because I've, kept my nose to the grindstone i've kept working like if i slow down am i gonna miss the next thing like is there any of that do you think yeah i mean i think you know for the first few years that i was in state champs we really really had that mentality it was like if this tour comes up we're gonna say yes to it because we just put out this record and we need to kind of stay active and stay relevant because we have momentum and if we you know if we lose that momentum who knows like what's going to come back. Like, you know, you see people put out their second record all the time and, you know, if it doesn't smash that momentum's just kind of there, we got lucky and we put out our record and, and our second record was really, really well received. And so we had this momentum, but we also had the support, uh, you know, and, and people weren't sick of seeing us play. You know, we would tour the U S like three or four times in a year. And those, I would see the same people coming out, like, you know, we had that fan base that was ri- that like they had the the want and the, the urge to see us still. You know, if that wasn't there, you know, we probably wouldn't have done it. So I think a lot of credit goes to the people that are kind of demanding that as well. But yeah, for us, yeah, I mean, momentum was was a really big thing. Um, it wasn't necessarily like being scared of missing out on an opportunity, but it was just about making the most out of the opportunities that we had as far as speak low i think be, like the way that i smashed it into my schedule that is kind of like well this is my only opportunity to do it so i have to um which kind of sucks you know because like 
it is a passion of mine and it is it's my baby like it is a a deep love i have a deep love for that music that i make and i don't think that it gets the attention that it should or could have you know i put out my my second record and i only so far i've only done three tours on it um in three years that's not a lot it's a good record too thanks man yeah and it, like i had a lot of big plans for it and i've just been busy you know state champs we uh it, it kind of became my priority and you know i'm thankful that i have a priority i'm thankful that i have a job and that i have like that people want to see us play and that we're still able to make records and whatnot but you know it, it's it's frustrating at times when you have another thing that you want to spend more time on and more put more energy into and you just physically can't yeah and i mean it's i mean i like and i don't know maybe this relates at all but like for me the way that you know my situation is now it's like i i really play i really play now because it's it's almost like that like therapeutic like that therapy for me you know what i mean like if i'm having a bad day or for like if i'm having a good day or if i've got something on my mind like i know i can you know come in here this is the spare room where we do the show but like i've got my guitar and my my guitars and my bass and everything like that's so like i can mm. come in and just sit down and and kind of noodle away and, and work through it is there an element of that where it's like well no matter what happens with any other project like i've like this is mine this is like i can yeah. come back to this like this is my like hold it close to you know hold the, the cards close to your chest yeah absolutely i mean that's that's a cool thing that I, that I have about speak low is because I, I, you know, I have that kind of creative freedom to just kind of write whatever songs that I want, you know, like my second record is very different than my first. And I think, you know, the stuff that I'm writing now is, is pretty different as well. And, you know, like the, I guess it's kind of a blessing and a curse because the fact that I don't really have that, like that same kind of fan base that state champs does, like I don't have to worry about, uh, losing it or like, you know, um, kind of freaking anybody out by what I, what I choose to make. You know, I think state champs were very conscious about the music that we make because we already have, we have a listener. Um, and we have people that kind of are anticipating things, you know, like not to say that speak low doesn't have a fan base that's anticipating anything, but I think that they know that they can count on me to just, I'm always just going to make whatever I want. And right you know, they can choose to listen to it or not. And, you know, I'm not going out there and doing a ton of tours. So I think when I am able to do that, I see the people who really love the band actually come out to those shows. And that's, what's really cool is, um, you know, they're loyal, even though they know that I, I don't get to do it as much as I want to. Yeah. So that, you know, that's cool. Well, and I, I wanted to, since you brought it up, I did want to kind of take a minute to talk about like the speak low sound, because I mean, you started, like you said, it was, it was just kind of, it was just you, you know what I mean? And then, you know, you, you put out, uh, I believe the single was called 30. Um, mm. and you know, that's very like bare bones, just kind of you guitar, like acoustic. And then we move into, um, we move into the, to the record, the, uh, everything, but what you need. And I got to tell you, man, eight weeks is a killer song, but my favorite on that track is not, and I'm going to tell you, it to me when i listen to it it has an element of it has an element of like that lick in there is it reminds me of almost like a, a really well polished like modest mouse riff and cool. like and not that what modest mouse doesn't do is it is or what modest mouse does isn't really well polished but i think they they a lot of their stuff is in, especially their early stuff is intended not to sound sure that way but it's it's i don't know man it's 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 the jam and then you go from that into i mean then you release nearsighted right and we've got uh contrasting colors um enough that baseline and that doom doom <laughs> doom that shit rips so like i want like you know the sound kind of like what you said it's like you're gonna put out what you want to put out but like if you listen to it you can tell 
and I mean, the state champ stuff is awesome. But when I think about you kind of growing as an artist from the person that I knew and, and the person that I see growing up and stuff like that, like I think Speak Low is really where the best illustration of that is. It's to to kind of like, okay, you're starting very stripped down and like look at what you've built and kind of created in, in your own kind of like sonic landscapes. Like talk to me a little bit about what that progression has been like. Is it just like, I want to try new shit or is it like I've been more conscious of it or? Yeah. I mean, I, I always think that I, I've had a very um, unorthodox like way of making music, I guess. Um, like I said, I'm not, I'm not classically trained in anything. I never really took any lessons. And, and so like for me, playing guitar was always messing up until I found what I wanted. Like even in Good Luck Varsity, I go back and I listen to like some of the leads that I did and I'm like, dude, these are kind of all over the place, but there's still some sense of like pop sensibility to it. Or like there's some catchiness to it or even some technicality. Um, Like whether I knew it or not, whether I was conscious of that or not, it was kind of like, it was musical. I was always, I was always into the bands that were more musical than they were like, catchy chorus or whatever Mm -hmm. this you know uh band's band if you will so like i I, that those are the bands that i loved growing up uh so when i moved when i found those bands that's what i wanted to emulate that's what i wanted to create and so you know when i started dry leaf project i was listening to a lot of like dashboard confessional and you know he was writing these like very catchy songs but there was also this sense of like really cool musicality to the guitar melody and like that he was playing in open tunings and like the lyrics, the lyrics were uh, thought provoking. They were like, I listened to them and was like, damn, this guy is like going through something. And so, you know, that's what I I was like, I want to make people feel like that. I put on my headphones and I'm like, I'm transported to that place and you know, Goo Goo Dolls and stuff like that. Those are the bands that I was listening to and was trying to write like. And so, you know, when I started, speak low it was it was really a it was really a project that was based around being heartbroken over a certain person and i think i wanted to write a lot like i my my mindset was write sad love songs like write these songs from experience that you have that like experiences that you've had that other people may not have had exactly but they will be able to relate to it. They'll be able to understand that feeling. And I've always tried to like chase a feeling when I'm writing a song. And um, so I don't know, I guess like that's just always what I've been trying to do. Um, So for the second record, it was, it was like chase that feeling, but also um, show, show people that you've evolved as a songwriter. Um, you know, you can still write the song on the acoustic guitar, but like, let's introduce these uh, other rhythmic sections. Let's 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 put in some funky bass, or let's put in this really cool piano line, or kind of like layer these vocals and stuff like that. And I mean, obviously, like Aaron Marsh from Copeland, who produced the record, mm-hmm. was super instrumental in making that record really what it was. Like, I brought him the songs, but you know, he pimped them out. You know, straight up, like we we had all those ideas floating around and he was really really able to like harness those and uh so i have a lot of a lot of um credit owed to him i mean he he really helped shape that record now what's the, what was that process like because i know like for me like copeland was one of those bands that was just like you would listen to them and they would just be like blow your mind yeah. cuz you're like oh these like you know, they're not at the time that, you know, I, I was really into them. They were kind of going through their, their explosion in that scene. They weren't much older than me, but it was like, kind of like the same thing with May where it's like, man, yeah. you guys are fucking like, you just think in a different way. Yeah. So what, I mean, what was it like then being like, Oh, Oh shit. Like I, I, I guess I'm working with you, you know, <laughs> like rubbing shoulders with him. Yeah, yeah. It was, dude, it was, it, I mean, the first time me and Drew went down to Florida and started working on these songs, uh, sometimes like we would just sit back and just laugh because we're like, dude, we're just sitting here on the couch while Aaron is like tinkering with the song that we brought to him. And he would just do some like 
just a little thing that was t- totally like something that we hadn't thought of or that we would have never done. And we would just sit there and just look at each other and we're like, no, this guy, this, this, this guy <laughs> That's why you're like, the man. thinks differently. Exactly. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's cool to like, obviously it was cool to work with somebody who was kind of a musical inspiration, a musical hero to you, but also just who thinks differently than you about music and kind of trying to meld those um, influences together and those, those ideas. And, you know, there was obviously like some, some pushback on some things and there was, I think that was all part of the process though, is like to, what you wanted at the end of the day was to get the best song, like was to get the song to where it needed to be and kind of like unlock the final product. Um, That was what was really fun about that. Making that record was just trying all this stuff that I wouldn't have if I would have recorded another record in a friend's living room, you know, because you would have been, I was only, you know, I only had access to a handful of instruments and a handful of sounds and, honestly not a lot of recording knowledge and a lot not a lot of like musical knowledge and i think when i was able to do it in a studio where i could you know play one of the seven pianos or jam on one of the 10 amps that he's got or different instruments like that was an inspiring place to be and i think that's kind of like it spells out the record really well in that way like you can see that i'm just jamming on a ton of different things and a ton of different sounds and ideas, um, but somehow still cohesive. Well, yeah. And I mean, like that, I think that was one of the things that I really enjoyed about it was kind of the, the experiment. Cause I think it's like, even in that, uh, in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that, uh, you've got that guitar that guitar part that's got that like it's like a crazy it's either like a reverb on it or like some kind of tremolo but it's like you're playing it's just kind of slapping a little bit Mm. and i was like man like this like especially when you're listening to somebody who you know started like i I get kind of the same feeling um like you know chris caraba dashboard right started on acoustic and then when he moved into that electric realm it was kind of like well you're same with you know what i mean like dylan playing fucking you know folk songs and and playing around on acoustic and then he comes out and plugs in electric and everybody's yeah. like what the fuck is going on it just kind of it just takes it to a different place so i don't know man let me ask you this was it kind of i mean was it easy to feel a little more free knowing that like like you said like you know you're not recording in the living room you're not working with just your limited knowledge of of the recording process like was there a level of like feeling lighter just being like oh i this is all i have to worry about i don't have to worry about like Mm. am i engineering it or you know where does this fucking mic need to go or anything like that like yeah i mean there was definitely some peace of mind knowing that the record that i was about to make was in good hands um you know because like i'd listen to other things that he had produced and you know he'd done some producing on copeland songs obviously and uh i definitely felt safe in that regard but at the same time i i think making that record was probably the most pressure i've ever felt making um, making music because you know i i released the you re-released the first record through pure noise and then i kind of started getting some trickle down fan base from state champs and i you know started expanding that that world that kind of was nothing before for speak low you know putting out the the independent release and having a hundred copies, like having a handful of fans and then having a fan base and then trying something new. Uh, I felt a lot of pressure, dude. I felt like some of those songs, I, it took forever to really get it right. And it was because I was like, I can't just put this, um, this, this first draft out. The first, my first record, everything what you need feels like when I listen to it, I'm like, maybe some of the charm of this record was because it was a first draft. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't re rewrite any of those songs. I I sat in my room and like when I was done with it, I was like, that's it, that's that's the song. And so for this, I was like, man, I really want to prove myself as somebody who can write a well-rounded song, you know, from front to front to front to back. I want to write the best lyrics and I want it to have the, these cool melodies and I want it to be uh, musically layered and I want it to be impressive to not only like 
the automatic fans, I guess I got from the state champs trickle down and the people that I had listening to the first record. But I was like, dude, I want to be respected as like a credible musician to these bands that I look up to and these music critics that are going to maybe listen to this. And I mean, dude, that, that for me, that was like the goal. Um, so I think, you know, and I think it was a pure goal. Like, I don't think I was doing it because I was like, let me flex my, right. You know, let me show you how elevated I've become. Exactly. Like (laughs) that was never the goal, but you know, it was, I wanted that. I wanted that cred. Well, I don't know. I think it's also like you, like, like you said, the first record is very, the first record is very, you know, Hey, okay. These are the songs is what it is. They captured this moment. And I think there, there comes, I mean, Again, I, I mean, even just from going from, you know, the bands I was in from, you know, the Rising Tide, which was a very, like, very pop focused band to then moving into Robots in the Garden, where like, our first song that we wrote is a, was three songs together as a 14 minute piece of music. I remember. And so it's like, like, completely di- so it's like oh like fuck i've been playing in this band for years a lot of people like us and if they hate this there's no chance that they're coming to any sh- you know what i mean right so i think there's sometimes there's a level of of fear where it's like man i'm swinging for the fences because it feels like this is what i should like i knew for me it right. was just like it's time for me to be doing something different but then at the same time you're like well shit i i mean i hope people like it because if not i don't know what i'm gonna do <laughs> you know what i mean yeah, it like, might not pay off yeah and it's, I mean, it's that, real- that's exactly, that's a real fear, man. It is it, it, like when I put out enough, that's, that's one of the more experimental songs that I've ever written at that point, you know, and that was the first single. I was like, people might just get off board right now. It's so catchy. But I, it was cool. It's so that baseline, dude, when that baseline comes in, it just fucking rip. Now who played that? Bass? Was that you? <laughs> Yeah, so you know, we had been working on the record for a couple months at that point and I think we were, you know, kind of getting down to the wire and we listened to, listened to the songs that we had and we realized we were like missing that kind of feel from the record, you know. You, you got kind of the whole spectrum except for what enough was. And that was actually the last song that we wrote for it and we stayed in the studio late one night because we realized we needed another song mm-hmm. and me and Drew were just jamming and it was actually a guitar part at first, you know, I was just playing that on guitar and then the next morning Aaron was like, all right, what do you got? And we showed him what we had and he was like, that has to be a bass line. It has to be on the bass. It's so cool. And that was it. Just laid that down and we built around it and, uh, that song just came out like it's funny because you know I said I I like toiled over most of the record but that one just flew out and it's funny and we were just like okay well then this is the this is the single but it almost didn't exist yeah well and I think that's one of those so Drew Drew Stoutenberg is is I mean he's he's an awesome drummer um I mean he's a he's a multi instrumentalist as well I mean I know he it's plays phenomenal. piano phenomenal so I mean. I think there are some times where it, like, first of all, it's gotta be, it's gotta be good to have someone like that in your corner when you're, when you're going to write this record. Cause you know, like we're going to write these, I'm going to write these songs and then I'll have like my friends come play and stuff like that. But yeah. it sounds like yeah. Drew kind of almost has a stake in it with you as far as like we're, we're yeah, working out together. Yeah, I mean, when Speak Low started, you know, the first EPs were, were just me and, you know, because because it was just acoustic and, you know, some percussion. Um, and then when I did the first record, you know, Drew played on all of those songs. And uh, when I would play a live show, it was just me and him, you know. And uh, so he's been there since the beginning. And then when I moved in with him in 2014, 15 – um, you know, that just opened up everything for us to be able to write songs together. And, you know, he would come home from work some nights and I would be working on a song all day because I didn't have a day job and we would work on parts together. And I think we, a lot of that record was born out of just like, because we were, you know, in the same room and we were always just like ready to go. Um, and yeah, man, I like, I don't play drums. So 
I, I just trusted him. Mm -hmm. I just was like, dude, I know he's going to do what's right for the song. And it was funny because when we were working with Aaron, Drew even said, he's like, Aaron taught me a lot about like holding back because sometimes I was just trying to do too much. And Aaron would just constantly say, do less, do less. And to the point where sometimes it was just a simple beat. And yep. that was ha what happened on enough. Like the beat, the beat was just, you know, a vehicle for the baseline to do its thing. Yep. Uh, you know, it was very simple. So yeah, it's great to have somebody that you trust and love and that you've kind of been writing music with for a long time to, to, to be able to like be on that journey with you. Um, so yeah, Drew is, he's a huge part of Speak Low. That's awesome, man. And, and I, I'm happy for you because I feel like you're fortunate to have that not just in one project, but in two, you know what I mean? Like, you yeah. know, like I've watched some, uh, some interviews with you where you kind of talk about, you know, the process of, um, the, the latest record, you know, wanting it to sound big, but still wanting it to sound like you guys. And you know what I mean? Like Blake Lipton. So it sounds like, and then, you know, you watch, uh, I watched uh, some of the footage from um, when you guys were recording the new uh, unplugged stuff as well. And it seems like, you know, there's a mm. good, like having fun and, and like a, a, a mesh and vibe there. You know what I mean? Um, oh, go ahead, man. I'm yeah. sorry. No, no. Yeah. It, it's uh, it's been a journey. You know, I think like, like you said earlier, uh, you know, when you are in a band with somebody for so long, there's always going to be that kind of like that burnout and those head butts and stuff like that. But, I think we're to a point right now where uh, we're having fun again, kind of. Uh, there was a point where things got tough and, you know, we were touring nonstop and we are very different people, so, but we're to a point where we're having fun again. And, and that's great because it makes me more excited to make music. Uh, and I, I don't know, man, like, I feel like, I feel like as long as you can, I'm sorry, there's some people light and fight. Fourth of July was fucking weeks ago, <laughs> so stop. Um, but um, but you know, I feel like as it's as long as you have that, like, I think when it stops being fun, that's when it gets. I mean, I know right. that there was a lot of a lot of the the reasons that I've quit playing in projects and stuff like that was because it just fucking stopped being fun, and there's not yeah. there's not any reason to keep doing it if it's not going to either get fun again or you know what I mean. You're just you know just done with it you know what i mean mm -hmm. um I, I did want to ask you this um how has how has you know for someone who is so busy um the way that you are you know with the touring and recording and everything like that and then we get covid and fucking the country just stops so what has that been like how is lockdown for you are you still i mean we're i know here we're in tennessee we're in uh we just, uh, we got declared by the white house as a red zone. So we're wearing masks everywhere we go and yeah. stuff like that. But I mean, how has it been for you? I mean, at the beginning, it, it felt like kind of a sigh of relief. Like, I guess when we didn't really know what it meant and we didn't really know how long it was going to last and you didn't know the depth of it, I guess, you know, when I thought, I thought like, Oh, maybe I have a month off. Like, I kind of treated it as, as like a, not necessarily a vacation because I was, you know, staying in the house and I, I, I got freaked out about it like pretty soon, like pretty, pretty quickly. So I was taking it very seriously. And I was the, I was the one in the, in the family group chat saying, go to the grocery store now and make sure you have your, your shit. Cause who knows how long this is going to last and whatnot. Right. Um, but when I, when I realized like, oh, you know, like we're going to have to push back some of our plans like it didn't bother me that much because I hadn't had time off in so long or when I did to have time off, I would, I would like travel a little bit or I would do a speak low thing or I would be recording. Um, so I got excited about it, I guess at first. And I was just at home every day writing songs. I was trying to challenge myself to write a song a day. And I was pretty loyal to that. I think the month of March I fell off. I've fallen off a little bit since then, but I've been writing a lot of music and, uh, you know, that's, I think the only real positive side of this, I guess, uh, you know, it kind of makes me a little bit nervous, like not knowing, uh, to what extent I have a job. Uh, cause I don't know when live music is going to come back. Everybody's saying it's going to be like one of the last industries to really be able to come back. I don't know 
what I'm going to do for a living, making money. I mean, I'm going to, at some point I I might have to get, uh, you know, a, a job, uh, doing something. I don't know what, but I'm trying to do some music. I'm trying to just keep writing and stay positive. Uh, but it's, it's definitely like starting to, uh, to have an effect on my mental state, I think. Yeah, man. It's, uh, it's funny because, um, Jay McGlone was just on the last episode. Um, and we were talking and, and one of the things that he brought up was that, you know, musicians tend to have a certain type of ego. You know what I mean? Where it's like, Oh, well, I've worked my whole life at this one, one thing. Like I, I yeah. fucking play guitar. I play shows like this is what I do. Yeah. So it can be hard to be like, well, shit, I got to go work at, you know, fucking Trader Joe's for yeah a couple months or something like that to like, like, and that's the one thing I'll say about you. I've never known you to ever be like the, Oh, I'm too good. Like, I'm too good for this. You know what I mean? Like you definitely are, you strike me as the kind of person where it's like, well, it may be shitty, but you know, yeah. I got to do what I got to do. And that, you know, it's not a, a long term kind of thing, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't think this is going to last forever, which is, you know, the upside of it. But at the same time, you know, I'm trying to be creative in a way where I can, um, I guess use my talents in, in, a, you know, an adapted way, I guess, to make money or to, to support my living situation, you know, um, luckily, like, I'm in a band that generates some kind of revenue from streaming royalties and stuff like that. And, you know, like I've been fortunate enough to like be able to be living on that and not have to go get a job yet, but you know, who knows how it's, how long it's going to last. Like I would love to start streaming on Twitch. Uh, you know, if that's something that could be sustainable or, you know, I've been really trying now that I live in LA, um, I've been trying to get into like the songwriting world. Um, which is something that I, I would really love to do. You know, I, I know I have some songs and if I'm not the person that's going to deliver them to the masses, like I don't mind, I'll write a song for somebody else. Like for I sure. don't, I don't have that. See, I may, maybe like a few years ago, I would have been like, nah, nah, that's not for me. But like now I'm like, dude, a great song is a great song, you know? And if I can have a part in it, that's, that's awesome. Like I don't need to be singing. I don't need to be the person on stage singing that. So you know, I'm going to try to get into that realm. Maybe we'll see. Have you thought about licensing for any of the speak low stuff? Cause like, yeah. dude, like that baseline from enough, like I could see that in a fucking Mercedes commercial. <laughs> It'd be like, doom, 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 doom. And they're showing just the lines of the car and shit. And there's some chick eating a hamburger on top or whatever they're doing. I mean, I'm down with that. I, I see it in like a, like a college movie or something, but you know, who knows? I will. I I'll, I'll talk to my management team. We'll see if we can get something happening, dude. Yeah, or uh, you can get a uh, IMDb Pro subscription, and mm-hmm. it will show you all the movies in production that are looking for music, and you can mm-hmm. just submit. It. They pick it. You get the fucking royalties from it. That's interesting. Yeah, I should look into that. But I mean, like, like, like I said, man, I could, I could hear that. I hear that song. I could see it in like a million different commercials. Like. Sick. And, An Apple commercial would be nice. Oh yeah, yeah. It's just a cutout, the white cutout of you, like they used to do of you two, where everybody's dancing and shit. Dude, those were pretty iconic. Dude, I've still got that damn record on my phone. I know <laughs> Me there's too. a way. There's a, every time I get in my car, it connects the Bluetooth, and I'm like, "Fuck this record." Dude, I swear to God, like not even three days ago that happened, but I, it it had never happened before. Something always, something, some other song always comes on, but that came on through the speakers through my Bluetooth. And I was like, this song is so shitty. What is this? And I realized I was like, Oh, it's that YouTube, YouTube record that's been on my phone for like four years. Dude. Yeah. I, uh, I, I stream everything. So I don't have any like other music, like physically on my phone. So whenever yeah. I connect, it just starts playing from whatever is like saved. And it's always the, I'm like, God. And my wife is always like, Oh, I love this song. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just, we hear it all the time. So it's like amazing, uh, but um, yeah, man, I did want to talk to you because you know I know with everything that's going on, it, it's been you know it's been crazy times, and and one thing that I I have really admired about you is you know you I think a lot of people sometimes think when you're you know a musician or 
it doesn't feel like it used to when there was like Rage Against the Machine that would come out and like burn a flag and then Tom Morello would like <laughs> rip right. some. So it's like everything now for the most part seems to be very like clean and whitewashed and kind of like, oh, how do we sell records? Where one thing that I've really admired about you is you do not shy away from how you feel on social media. Um, one of the things I want to talk to you about is there was that family that was like Trump 2020, just doing that song. <laughs> and then I, dude, I saw that video and I went into the comments cause I was like, Oh, this is just going to be a rip factory. Like people are just going to be tearing these people sure. apart. The first comment i saw or the first <laughs> the first tweet back i saw was your fuck trump song and i was like no shit how like how crazy would like what is the odds that that would be like the the first response back that i saw and i watched that video first of all it's a good song the melody is <laughs> is awesome dude i, I gotta it, like, give i times. gotta give credit i gotta give credit to the original song the melody was there the song was there dude it i was just like I was like, this is so, so I think I retweeted it. I'm pretty sure I retweeted it, but it's, it's so, it was so funny. So like, like, and I know, I mean, obviously you're in, in Cali now, but um, you know, we're both from Michigan. I know living down in the South, it's a completely different world politically and political sure. views wise than being <clears throat> in Michigan. Um, like, like, has it been the other thing I saw that that of yours that I really liked is you posted something, and then somebody would come in and and it was on Facebook or something. They'd be like, "Well, what about this?" And you just pulled full Seth Rogen and were like, "Fuck off, fuck off!" <laughs> like it's the response. To, so I was like, "Okay, so either Ryan's very passionate or he's very angry about or both about what's going on right now." So like, like yeah, how man. has that been? Like, how are you dealing? It's been pretty interesting, you know. I think like you said, a lot of, a lot of people who are kind of like in the public eye are less than in a hurry to like talk about something that may be, um, divisive, I guess. Uh, and you know, I think for a long time I was, I was probably one of those people. I'm, I'm a very passionate person about like what I believe and I'll have that conversation with you all day long, but I might not necessarily, you know, put it out there, um, to attract like that kind of conversation happening around me, unless I felt very educated or, you know, well-versed on that, that thing. And, um, I guess when, you know, the George Floyd tragedy happened, like a lot of that changed for me because I started seeing really clearly the, the divide between, the people who were kind of focusing on that, that as a, I mean, they started, they were focusing on the wrong things, I guess, or they didn't think that this was anything more than just a a criminal who was killed, you know, something just like really, really unconsciously maybe racist views just out there for everybody to see. And for me, I was like, something just turned on. I was like, so fucking angry about what had happened. And even more so angry about the people who were making it about them or making it into this um, spectacle of ignorance, I guess. And it was really tough for me to see that from some of my my extended family. And, um, if, if you know me, I think, you know, that, uh, my family is very, very close knit. And I think as I have gotten older, I've realized that my family has always been very, very close knit because we've kind of had a surface level relationship. Um, not to say that there's really anything wrong with that. Like you can get together in a family at, at gathering and just have a good time. But that's because nothing of importance really ever comes up. You know, there, I grew up religious. I grew up in the, in a Christian family and, you know, 
pretty much everybody on my mom's side is Christian and everybody on my dad's side is a Christian. So, so there's not really these clashing of these big personalities and these differing opinions. And I think this was really one of the first times that had set that off to where I was really upset about the injustices that had, had happened and had been happening that I had been blissfully ignoring in my, you know, my privilege. And this is the first thing that was like, really like, okay, you need to, you need to like acknowledge this and then also use what you know and use your platform and use this um, opportunity to like educate some people who are choosing not to be educated. And then when I saw like a lot of that, those, those opinions that I like deem ignorant coming from certain family members, I, I kind of exploded and I was like, this is where I like need to like start really, really diving into these kind of topics because if those people are going to listen to anybody that they're going to listen to their family members. And I think that was kind of like my mission was to really like learn about myself and learn about these, um, these, these, um, these unconscious biases that I had and maybe some prejudices and, and some like racist things that I had probably done in the past or said or thought or whatever, you know, um, and work through those and try to like kind of spell those out to the people who don't acknowledge them, don't see them, don't, you know, don't, don't think, maybe don't think they exist. Don't think that that privilege exists or don't think that anything's wrong with this or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it's kind of been a, it's kind of been a whirlwind since all that happened. And, and, you know, obviously like it's a never ending journey of, of education and, and kind of like, um, I guess change, but, uh, I'm, I've been excited about like what I've seen in, uh, some of the conversations that I've been having and, and even in myself and, uh, yeah, it's really, really important uh, to not shy away from that stuff because you think that you're going to like either lose a fan or lose a friend or whatever. Because you got to think at the end of the day, like if that person is not necessarily like aligned with something that you know is truth, are they a person that you need in your life? Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, like. I think you're right on, on a couple, you know, I, I agree with you. I mean, not even right. on. I think you're right on all of that, but there's, you know, I think there's this, this kind of fear a lot of the time that it's like, Oh, well you don't like, especially with your family, like, well, I don't want to shake things up. You know what I mean? Right. And I think it's, it, it's, it's perfectly okay to, to be like, listen, you know, uncle Bob or whatever, like, you know, I love you and I understand, but you know, especially with the whole, the whole religion, the the Christianity, like I, I am not someone who is a religious person. However, I believe that Christianity provides a benefit to so many people. Like it's not a bad thing to be. It's, it's essentially, you know, at its core, it's like, Hey, be good to other people, love people the way that you want to be loved. Like it's a, right. and it saved a lot of people's lives. You know, I don't, I know a lot of people who have, kick drugs and have been like hey well i'm you know i'm i used to be neck deep and neck deep in crack and now i'm neck deep in jesus you know it's just like i'm it, it pulled me out you know what i mean so yeah. it's uh but you know i also have a problem with people who i have a problem with people who cherry pick to back up shitty arguments you know what i mean sure. like you know Jesus didn't like the Jesus didn't like the tax collector. You know what I mean? Like that. And that was all, I think that's like the whole thing with Matthew is like, he was like, stop being a tax collector. You don't need that money. Just mm. come like, just come follow me. But then we've got mm. somebody in the white house. who's like, I have billions of dollars. I have so much money. It's ridiculous. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it, I, I don't get like when he tear gassed all those people, I, I've said this before, but like he tear gassed all those people to take a picture holding a book that he's never read. And then, oh yeah, I would like to. I, I've said this before, but I would pay. I would. I would take my entire stimulus check and give it to him to hear him say Ephesians. I would just. I want to hear how it sounds coming out of it, that. 
fucking it's orange so, mouth. It's so frustrating, dude. That, that's one of the most frustrating things that I, I like about this presidency for me is is seeing the people who are um, either Christians or, or religious in my life, like just totally gobbling it up, like totally, uh, totally sold on the pandering of uh, this man as, as like a, as an evangelical Christian, as, as like a, a man of God, which he absolutely is not. And, you know, like I'm, I've never been one to judge somebody's heart. I know that's not something that you're necessarily supposed to do. You don't know everything about this person. You don't like, you don't know their life, but like there is nothing about this man's words or actions that, that are any anywhere near Christ for me. Um, and I don't, I don't consider myself a religious person anymore, you know, and it, I'm, I'm somebody who I think is unique in that way where I think kind of when you grow up, um, in a religion and then you walk away from it, you're, you're usually pretty, pretty pissed off about it mm-hmm. or something is driven that wedge to where you're like, I totally want to disassociate with everything and everybody that I, that I had this, you know, um, uh, this experience with I'm not one of those people I I realized it wasn't for me and it was a really long difficult thing uh, for me to work through and I still still have some kind of feelings of guilt and shame sometimes about that but I never like look at my experience and say man I wish I wouldn't have gone through that uh, because I do think in a lot of ways that's made me better but like I have that wealth of knowledge now to have seen uh, what Jesus st- stood for. And, and, and I've seen really, really great people who claim to be Christians in my life. Donald Trump doesn't seem like one of those people to me. Um, but you see these people who you think are well-rounded, like decent people, just praising this guy or believing what he's saying and then using that like – Jesus appointed this person and put him in charge and I believe him because he's the leader of the free country and all this stuff. And like, I'm just like, dude, you are fucking stupid. Like, that's what I want to say to these people. And I really try hard not to <laughs> try um, to say it in a more civil way. I, try. I disagree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just so frustrating, man, to see people just think like, Oh, well, it, you know, he's a God appointed person in the white house. And I, you know, trust him because I'm a Christian, you know, like, Dude, you can you can be a Christian and know that this guy is a total total cock. Right. Well, and I think the other thing is too is that like God supposed like you know God gave you free will because if he didn't, <clears throat> you know what I mean. Like if he didn't give that to you, then then everything is on that preset path. There's no, am I making the right choice? Am I making yeah. the wrong choice? So like sure. with that free will, it's totally possible that you can use that free will to make a shitty choice and vote like. That's the thing. People say like, you know, it's, it's about, it's a, it's about how you live your life. The, like the example, right. That's the whole thing is that you want to, you want to, um, you want to preach to others and want to live as an example. This dude's paying money to fucking porn stars. He stole money from charity. And the thing that bothers me is that everyone's like, well, that's what he's done in the past. But every day, like his, his company's, just made a shit ton of money out of the, the, uh, the PPP, the paycheck protection program. Mm. He gave a bunch of money to churches who don't pay taxes. You know, like, like I get, like you can't keep saying, well, that was in the past when he keeps racking up, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, he just drives me crazy. He's still not a good person, you know? And, and it is true. You know, they, they like to point out the things that they're, that he's done that, benefit them or that align with like what they think. Like, you know, I, I know a lot of people vote for Donald Trump because of, you know, simply, you know, he's, he's against abortion. And I know a lot of Christians, that's one of the main things that they need out of a president is, you know, make sure that, you know, abortion is, is illegal or, uh, you know, like I need somebody who stands for that because that's one of my views. But like, you know, if you really are pro-life, like you should care about these millions and millions of other people who are affected by the policies that this guy is making that are ki- that are killing them or that are locking them up or that are deporting them or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like you 
you're not really pro-life. You're not really worried about that. You just think that abortion's wrong because it's somewhere in the Bible it says that you, you know, whatever. whatever. Well, and, it, and it also says in the Bible that life begins once the first breath is taken. So like, and that's the thing is exactly what you said. Like, yeah, you're pro-life until the the single mom who has this kid who, you know, has a high school diploma and is working at two fast food restaurants can't fucking put food on the table and you're like no nah, this bitch doesn't need food stamps you know yeah. what i mean like we don't need we don't need uh community outreach programs like you're pro-life until you actually have to take care of them after they're born and then it's yeah. like i don't give a shit you know and you and you can't understand why that person might turn to drugs or alcohol for some kind of relief like you know that's that stuff does really really bother me and i think that's kind of why i've started to get more vocal about these things that i believe because those people maybe haven't been challenged before or you know i think as myself as when i was a christian i was every day i was thinking like why don't i necessarily agree with this thing or like why do i feel guilty about this thing that seems so natural to me and i was asking all these questions that i didn't see any of the people around me asking or maybe they were but they weren't you know they were embarrassed about it or not as vocal about it and I don't see a lot of those people asking those questions or ever being challenged by those people who may have a different perspective from them. Um, and I think that's that's key in in growing and learning uh, is being challenged by uh, somebody who thinks differently than you or who, have, who has had a different experience than you, who can provide that kind of perspective for you that you might not ever get otherwise. Well, yeah, I mean, it, like... Can you imagine if the only people you were surrounded by thought exactly like you did? I, I mean, would that, f- fucking want to kill myself. It's so I'm not interesting. That's why I do this podcast. So I can talk <laughs> to people that I find interesting and maybe piggyback off of that. But I'm like, I'm not doing shit. You know what I mean? If it was just a, if it was just a bunch of people like me in a room, I'd be like, all right, guys, good talk. I'm out of here. You know what I mean? So like, oh, shut up. Like you're interesting. Yeah, but I mean, to an extent, man, but not, you know what I mean? Not interesting enough where I'd want 30 people just like me and those are the only people I hang out with. You know what yeah. I mean? I think you're right. Like, you need to have people of 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 different views, different backgrounds, you know, d- different ideologies that you can have those conversations. And, and that is one thing I will say is that I feel like with with everything that's happened with with George Floyd and the protests. And I mean, I mean, I'm having conversations with my mom. I've never had before, right, right. you know, and, and I've heard plenty of people say, well, you know, exactly what you said, like he was a criminal, you know, and I don't know why he's the martyr, but I think Chappelle said it best where it's like, you made him that martyr. He's on t-shirts because you killed this unarmed dude who wasn't resisting arrest. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like you fucking did that. We didn't select him. So like, you know, right. stop fucking killing people and we wouldn't even be having this conversation, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the one of the, one of the, like one of the greatest things I think I've been afforded by touring is, is meeting those kind of people from all walks of life, you know, like meeting um, people from different backgrounds and cultures and, and colors and, and uh, orientations and all these, these things that like, you know, I, I, I sometimes I do understand why I, somebody could be ignorant to these things because like you said, you know, the only people that they've ever met are people that, that look like them who that believe the same things they do. You know, I've been lucky enough to meet all these other people that they only see as a, as a label as, as gay or as, or, uh, you know, black or whatever, like, you know, those, those are people that they don't see as people sometimes. And I've been able to, to like have conversations with those people. And I've had the opportunity to like know their lives and uh, know that they're also just like me. And that's, that's one of the greatest things I think I've been able to get from touring the world is, is that, um, you know, that, that perspective. Oh, I mean, I think I, I really do think that that is a lot of where the problem lies with a lot of folks is that, you know, I mean, I know people that live here in, in, I mean, I'm 15 minutes outside of Nashville. So I'm like essentially where Plymouth Canton was between like Ann Arbor and Detroit, you know what right. I mean? Like, so 
I'm 15 minutes out of the city, but I know people that have that down here that have never left here that, you know, they, like you said, only know people that think exactly the way that they do. And, and it's a thought it's a, it's crazy because sometimes it's crazy to see that sometimes prejudice prejudice can be hereditary. You know what I mean? Mm. Like you hear somebody and not that it didn't happen in Michigan or not that it doesn't happen in California, but like, I think it's just, I think it's just a a more prevalent here than maybe I was used to when I was growing up, but you can literally see like where somebody's dad will be like, and let me tell you about these people, blah, blah, blah. And then there's something, well, and then their kid is like, well, you know, there's these people and they're, it's like, you're just passing that shit on. Right. But I am like, I will say though, I'm very hopeful because I feel like I've talked about this before, but it feels like we are kind of in the middle of like the second big civil rights. Yeah. Like, you know, my, my only fear is that hopefully people don't get distracted by like tearing down statues. I don't know if you saw, but there's a petition to change uh, Canton high school's name from really Canton chiefs to something else, which I'm totally cool with, but like, like don't let that shit be enough don't let exactly. the, don't let the washington redskins change their name be like right. well fucking racism's gone like that's a good start but like yeah. fucking keep going don't let it, it it almost feels like it's companies being like well we like here's how we'll appease you you know what right. i mean so it's right. like hold their fucking feet to the fire can we hold that thought for one second i am gonna piss my pants yeah dude let me i'll pause it real quick all right, cool. And we're back. So hopefully that was a good bathroom break for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I was, I was dancing during that, that conversation. I was like, Oh man, I got to go. But yeah, I didn't know if I was getting under your skin. And then when you were like, Oh, I got to take a piss. I was like, okay, that makes sense. I, I'm not making them uncomfortable. <laughs> no, 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 dude. Uh, I was like, man, our conversations have been really like effortlessly uh, flowing. So uh, I, I felt bad that I'm, that I like cut it. No, not a big deal at all, man. No, I just, you know, I just, I just, I don't know. I hope things get better. It seems like it's, seems like we have the potential to do something really good. So I just hope it. I think so too. I think so too. I mean, that's, that's kind of like what I was saying as, as when, as the protests were kind of starting, like, I'm sad that it's gotten to this point to, you know, where this stuff is necessary, but at the same time, I'm like hopeful because this seems different than, you know, maybe the other times it's happened in my lifetime. Um, so, you know, I saw, I saw a lot of support from, from people my age and people that maybe people I knew personally that I didn't even expect to it to come from. So I thought that was really cool. And I think the fact that conversations are happening between family members who have very different viewpoints can happen or, and are happening. I think that's, that's a positive thing. Um, I, you know, obviously I think there's a long way to go and I think there are a lot of distractions. Um, but in a weird way, I think like COVID happening now and people being home and being able to go to the protests and being able to like really put in work to like make things like actually change like a societal, like real lasting change. You know, I think the timing is pretty pretty impeccable yeah and i've i've said this before but i think you know as terrible as the george floyd video is because i mean if you watch that if you have a heart in your chest you're like oh this is like this is fucking murder yeah but but i really think that if if george floyd was a stick of dynamite that covid cut the wick you know what I mean? Because we've we've been told for however many months, like, stay home. We're all in this together. It's all about us. You got to look out for one another. You know what I mean? And then as soon as, like, any restrictions are lifted, it's like, well, cops are back out there killing black folks. You know what I yeah. mean? And I think, every, I think with everybody being home, number one, they were forced to see it. Because it's not like, you know, you, like, it's not like you're sitting at work and you're like, oh, that's fucked up. Let me go back to you know, doing this TPS report or whatever I'm doing (laughs) to, to you're like, you're in a spot where like you can actually absorb the, the gravity and like the utter just fucking disgust of what is on that, you know, eight minutes and change video. And then I think the other thing is people are just like, this is fucking bullshit. 
You know what I mean? Like, we're like, I don't know, man, that, that for me, that's what it was for the big thing for me. It was like, you, we've been spending so much time just being like, we're, we're all each other's neighbors and, you know, and then just something it's like, yeah, we're all here to look out for each other unless we're black folks or unless you're, you know, a teacher and we don't want to give you fucking hazard pay for COVID or, you know, like, yeah. like I don't know. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, there is, there's a lot of factors to like making these things happen and making these things, um, you know, effective and like work, you know, I, I was like, the reason that these protests were so consistent here in LA and everything was just like, you know, people don't have to go back to work. They're like, well, I'm going to go back and protest tomorrow because I also don't have anything to do tomorrow. And, you know, I think that was a, that was a good thing. That was a, that was a really good thing for the movement because, you know, obviously it's still happening. I think it's, it's, it's dwindled in support. I think a little bit like as, life is kind of going on but you know a lot i see a lot of people saying like oh this is it was just a trend it was just a trend like no i mean you just because you're not seeing it as much doesn't mean that it's not going on and i think um you know like i said because because covid happened and you you know you said people are forced to see it like you can't just turn off your phone you turn off the news because like that's all that really has been happening um while you're home and you're trying to fill your time or find something to read or see or whatever. And like another thing, and here's another thing, here's another thing. Like it's going to eventually start to piss you off and you're going to go one of two ways. You're going to be like, I need to get involved and I need to make sure this stops happening. Or you're one of the people who are just like, I don't really care. And you've always been that person. Yeah. And that's why it's been able to happen for so long. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy how much being apathetic is this is similar to condoning. You know what I mean? Just being yeah. like, well, eh, like fucking shit happens. To, uh, like is, is to me just kind of feels like being like, well, fuck it. I mean, God was just doing his job. You know what I mean? Right. Like it's, it's fucked up, man. But I, I don't know. I'm just, I, the other thing that drives me crazy is the fucking media and the only reason i say that is like we've got the 24 hour whether it's cnn or fox or whatever like the looting is happening and everyone's like it's 24 hour coverage and blah and then as soon as that looting is over and it's just peaceful protests they have to you know there's that old saying that if it bleeds it leads so it's like hey these are just a bunch of people you know peacefully protesting police brutality and you know we we gotta you know some kid shot somewhere so we got to go with that you know what i mean like it's when you when you're on for 24 hours and you have to keep people watching it's like uh what what's the next just like thing that i can get in front of them that grab right. you know what i mean what sad right. shit or tragic shit so it's it's you know now that the looting's over like the only time i see anything about the protest is when somebody like defaces a black lives matter mural and you know what i mean like it's some yep. um, like some something you can get pissed off about. And they're like, well, don't forget this is happening. Look at this. You know what I mean? It's just, I don't know. It drives me fucking crazy. Yeah. I, it's funny. Like as, as I get older, I, I, I like listen to more and more talk radio and I've been listening to a lot of talk radio lately. And it's, it's, uh, I feel like my dad now, you know, <laughs> because I remember when I was a kid, like that's all he was listening to. Uh, um, Oh, what is it? What I don't even know what radio station is, but I just know all the jingles. And I was like, oh my God, this is the station that my dad was listening to when I was a kid <laughs> that I hated. And now I'm listening to it. And it's, uh, it's interesting to see the people who are allowed to have certain opinions on the radio. And, and uh, a lot of them are pretty extreme. So I don't know. I don't, it's, it might not be the best thing to be listening to for me, but it it keeps me, it keeps me like fired up about the injustices that, that are happening that have been happening forever. So in that way, I'm like, yeah, I need to keep doing this because there are still these people who have these platforms who are allowed to say this stuff that I don't agree with that other people are going to just eat up and then continue to believe and perpetuate these certain ideologies and whatnot. So, well, I I feel like I have to, so we, I've never been an anxious person or someone that like, like struggled with anxiety until COVID happened. So like, Dude, I have a, same. I'm not allowed to look at my wife and I made the rule that uh, two hours before bed, I'm not allowed to look at my phone. So the thing that ends up happening to me is like, 
well, I'm going to go to bed at 10. And then I like look at my phone at 8.30. I'm like, oh, I'm going to bed at 10.30. And then finally, I finally get to bed at like, <laughs> finally get into bed at like one. But, um, I, but I feel like I have to know what's going on. And, and number one, I want to, you know, they're seeing fucking COVID cases and kindergarten kids and for like, sh- like skyrocketing right now. And I'm like, my kids too. So like, I got to fucking make sure that I'm keeping her in this crazy right. fucking pretend bubble, you know what I mean? Cause, and then number two, I want to know what's going on. So when somebody says some dumb fucking conspiracy shit, like you heard 5g caused COVID and it's turning all the ducks gay. Like I want to <laughs> be able to be like, you're, no, you're wrong. And this is why you're wrong. You know what yeah. I mean? Like that's super important because I think like when you're putting, like you feel more, equipped to have those conversations when you put in the work and when you know like what's happening and i think a lot of people for the longest time just kind of skated by like not needing to know anything and have those kind of conversations because they weren't being challenged and i was one of those people you know i I was one of those people who kind of like lived in like a, a a conservative white bubble um even though you know i'd had all these experiences and had been exposed to all these different people you know like I didn't really necessarily speak on something unless I felt like equipped to do so. Like now I'm like, okay, with all this like really dramatic stuff that's happening, I want to be equipped. I want to be knowledgeable and like in the know about all this stuff because I want to have a valued opinion. I want to be able to have a conversation that might, you know, have some kind of impact or change somebody's mind. Um, Super important. Yeah. Well, like, my sister-in-law, like I love her. She just started where we live in, in Tennessee. They, they just starting yesterday, put a mask mandate into effect. So before it was kind of like, they called it uh Rutherford responsible where it was, you know, we encourage you to wear a mask, but we're not going to tell you to do it. Just be responsible. Right. Yeah. And then we just kept seeing cases go up and they're like, all right, fuck that. Wear a mask. And uh, my, my sister-in-law was like, well, you know, I don't really, you know, I don't go anywhere. And if I run in somewhere, it's just like get a pack of smokes or anything like that. And I was like, let me send you like fucking 12 articles real quick about <laughs> yeah. like why you should be wearing a mask. You know what I mean? Like, that's that great. Just, you know, it's like, and I, but I don't, I also don't want to be, I don't want to be a dick. You know right. what I mean? Like, I just want to be like, listen, I just want to give you this information. If you, if you are willing to read it, maybe you'll yeah. change your mind. If not, you know what I mean? Do what, do it, do with it what you will. Yeah. Cause the, the, the one thing that I hate is the, I'm not wearing a mask cause it's taking away my freedoms my personal liberties. God damn it. This is America. You know what I mean? And like, that's a lot of people too. Dude. And it's like, you have, you have no idea what constitutes a right. Like I have to wear a shirt. I'm a fucking fat dude. They don't want me in the, the Mapco gas station with no shirt on my bare feet walking around. Like they just, they don't want that. It's not a nice thing to see. Like there's no difference between that and wearing a mask. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. It just drives me. And I know people that'll, you know, play paintball and wear a mask on their face for eight hours or go hunting and wear a mask on their face for eight hours, but like 15 minutes in Kroger and you're going to, it's really just, it's the least you can do. Like it's really easy. I, you know, I, I, I don't understand what the problem is. I, I can understand people who genuinely like don't think it matters, not wanting to wear them. But I think if you read anything or listen to any, anything that like, tells you otherwise then just wear the fucking mask yeah well in the the other thing too is that like there are people out there being like according to the americans with disability act they cannot deny you service if you say you have so when you go to kroger tell them that you have a medical condition you can they cannot refuse your service so it's like kroger is now like yeah you're right we can't you can't come in the store but i'll do your shopping for you you know what i mean like we just have to offer you a service not right. the way that you want it. You know, you know what I mean? So sure. it's just, I don't know, man. It's uh, it's just. It's a crazy it, world right now, man. It feels like extreme trolling with like extreme consequences. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like it feels like yeah. the internet has come to life. It's like a Pepe meme that like <laughs> can breathe in your face and fucking kill you. <laughs> it's, it's gross. I think it's just like really exposing who those people on the Reddit forums are. 
you know what I'm saying? Or like those people who are on Facebook, like you don't, you see, you laugh at those things and then you see those people in real life and you're like, Oh my God, like those are the people that I'm making fun of. Yeah. Those are the people that act, they do exist. Well, and the one good thing I will say about Trump, which is even crazy to even think, but I don't blame him for crazy racism, but I do think he's got a thousand foot fan and he's just like, where's that, where's that fucking fire? Like he's fan of the flames and it makes it so easy because people now, man, just aren't, they're fucking brazen. It's like, like Ohio just had some fucking like straight up clan rally just marching yeah. to, like we haven't done this in 60 years but just letting you know that we're still here you know what i mean so yeah he it's not it's not like he this man created the racism but he is encouraging it absolutely yeah it's i don't know i feel like it just makes it a little bit easier to be like okay i i see you i i see you and i can avoid you which you know i'll i'll take that just to be like i don't want to fuck with you you know yeah that's fair but, well, you know, I, I know we've been going for a little while here. We're coming up at almost two hours. And, and I wanted to kind of end talking about something a little bit more positive. Um, <laughs> okay. Because there's, there's a lot of good stuff. I didn't want to – all that downer shit, we'll see you next week. So, um, so I wanted to talk about State Champs Unplugged, man, because I feel like you guys sure. have taken – you've taken the quarantine and you've really kind of maximized an opportunity there. So the singles that you drop right now, uh, 10 a.m., crying out loud that one crying out loud and uh criminal uh and criminal yep. is just a acoustic version of one of the songs from the last record right yep yep so um talk to me a little bit like where did that idea was it just like boredom or was it like hey i gotta do something or well i actually you know it's funny because like we had been talking about doing another acoustic thing we, we put one out in 2015 uh 2014 and I mean, every time we do a VIP session or every time we go on tour, people are like, we want to see you play acoustic. We want to see these songs. And Derek has just such like a great voice for acoustic music. You know, he really, he really does. I, that's one of the things I think that stands out about your band in general. Like I, yeah. I noticed it too. What you guys did the, uh, the uh, matchbox 20 for the songs to save my life. Yeah. And I was like, damn dude, like it's like, it's, it's a pop punk version, but it's still like, it's at that same caliber. I like, I like, I'm a big Rob Thomas fan. I was like, same, like fucking did it proud. I, I thought so. Cool. Yeah. I mean, we just had had, had that idea for a while and uh, we actually got in the studio before like all this COVID start stuff happened. So we got, we got a little bit lucky with the timing there because it was already finished, you know, before all this stuff happened. And then, um, you know, lockdown happened and we had some plans that we, we had some stuff, booked already to get pushed back so we were just trying to get kind of creative and think like well what can we do well our 10 year anniversary is coming up so we put on this variety show that was like all uh online based and we did these songs acoustically so it was a really really cool way to like release a song or you know announce a record where it's not just going to get dropped into the abyss and get lost uh so we wanted to do like an event and you know we put out the song and we had got some music videos and we just dropped uh, a new single yesterday, 10 a.m. So the record comes out in August, August 14th. And it was just a like a pressure-free, stress-free, fun thing for us to do, honestly. It was, it was like one of those things that we kind of had always kicked around the idea of doing another one of. But we were like, when do we have time? We found some time and wanted to write some original songs before we put out a, like a full length. So... That was really it, man. Just something fun to do. That's a, that crying out loud, that crying out loud song has been stuck in my head for like a week, dude. It's super catchy. It's really, really good. So great. Um, I, you know, I wanted to ask this. You know, again, it's it's a it's a crazy time out there, and you know, I know especially for musicians, you know, you spend your life, you spend countless hours putting in that, you know, like putting in work, you're recording, you're touring. And, and, you know, I think I was just on a message board where people, Oh no, somebody messaged, uh, Adam Lazara from taking back Sunday. Cause they were doing charity. Like I'll do a, like 50 bucks. I'll do a video message. Yeah. We take that money and then we pay, you know, our staff and right. like tour guys and stuff. And somebody messaged him was like, well, you know, why don't you just take some of the crazy amounts of money that you've made over your years of being a successful band and, 
and pay your band out of your own pocket. And he's like, Hey, that's not how this works. Like right. we're not Led Zeppelin. If we're not touring, we're not making any fucking money. You know what I mean? So yeah. Like what is for people listening right now that like want to support and want to show like, what is the, whether it's speak low or whether it's state champs, like what is the best way right now for people to support, to show support to, to your projects, your bands, um, you know, what's the best way to do that? I mean, yeah, he's absolutely right. We're, we're in the music business, but if you're not touring, it's, it's, it's really difficult because the, you know, the record industry has totally changed. Like you're not, you're not making the bulk of your salary on your songs anymore. You're kind of a glorified t-shirt salesman. Uh, you know it's and it sucks to say but like you play play the shows and you make the most amount of money on your merch um that's where like the the profit comes from so even still like now i guess the best way to support us financially is buy the merch or like at the very least just share our band share our songs share our music videos with somebody because like you said you know people are online all day all all night at this point you know everybody's on their phone and their home and you know, if you can share, share those resources, that would be great. Um, like we got that new record coming out. It'd be awesome if you picked it up, uh, stream the music. I mean, really like, I guess that's it. You know, we're not playing shows for a while. So who who knows like what's going to happen, but, um, yeah, that's it. Well, we'll, uh, you know, we have a Facebook page and uh, Twitter and Instagram. So we'll, uh, we'll, you know, post out all the links. We'll share the, uh, the, um, the Spotify links and all that stuff. And then uh, in the show notes, we'll have the Spotify page. We can do uh, like the merch store, all that stuff, man. I know it's uh, awesome. I know it's a crazy time, man. And, and, you know, just want to help in, in any way that we can. And, and again, dude, I just got to tell you, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up here, but, I can't, I just, this has been such a pleasure for me, man. Like again, Same. going from that kid who showed up to the first show and those, and those fucking FUBU shorts and like <laughs> watching you like pick up an instrument and, and find something that you fell in love with and pursue it. And, and then to go to challenging yourself and speak low to winning, you know, best breakthrough band 2016 for alternative press, by the way, you fucking, killer that shit's awesome dude <laughs> so i don't know man i just i uh i really wanted to say thank you for being here i am uh i don't know i uh i consider myself very lucky to be your friend and uh i don't know if this was just uh awesome to, to be able to hang out with you dude likewise man it was a pleasure when you hit me up i was i was instantly excited and uh you know we haven't we haven't kept up as much as i would have liked over the years because you know i've always considered myself a big big john connor fan so thank you for having me on the show and uh it was it was really really great it was really great for sure man i i i seriously once everything's back up and running dude i'd love to have you come back on again and of course um we do me a favor and stick around for me after we wrap up let's do it awesome well thank you so much ryan graham everybody state champs uh speak low if you speak love Go to the YouTube page, go to the show notes, whether you're listening on <laughs> Apple, Stitcher, wherever, buy a t-shirt, stream the album. They've got some fucking awesome videos. There's a, uh, there's a video of them uh, at like a water park carnival. It cracked me up. So watch that, share it with your friends, but we'll put all the links in. Uh, that is it. That is episode 24. Thank you guys for checking it out. Ryan, thank you again for being here and we will see y'all next week. Yeah.